Well, hello, everyone. Um, I see our audience are still joining in, so I'll give it just another minute or so, uh, and then we'll begin. Okay, so hello everyone. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the Teaching in the Age of AI's panel discussion today. So this is the first of many conversations AI that we hope to have at the University of New Mexico as we consider the impact of this emerging technology on higher education. So my name is Leo Lo. I am the Dean of the College of University Libraries and Learning Sciences here at UNM. And I'll be moderating the panel today. Um, I would also like to thank Pamela Chi, our Associate Provost for Student Success, who has been instrumental in getting this panel set up. So the launch of ChatGPT by OpenAI in November last year, which now seems so long ago, but it's only just been six or four months or so. Uh, it's created such a buzz or, or shock among uh, everybody and, and especially educators. And we believe uh, it is an opportune time to explore the use and development of AI in an academic setting. And it's important to consider both the potential benefits and challenges associated with this technology. So here's an outline of what we're trying to cover today. Uh, first of all, you know, what is ChatGPT? Uh, the potential of AI in education, uh, what are some of the strategies for uh, teaching with AIs and definitely ethical considerations of AI in education. And we will leave some time at the end for Q&A and then we'll wrap up with you know, some next steps. And we are very excited to bring together a diverse group of experts to look at AI in education from different perspectives. So let me introduce our panelists today. First, we have Lydia Tevia, the chair of the computer science department at the University of New Mexico. So Lydia's primary expertise is in the integration of machine learning for the planning and control of automated motions and tasks in robotics and computational biology domains. And she's currently serving on the National Academy panel on using machine learning in safety critical applications. Next, we have Victor Law, the Program Director of the Program of Organization, Information and Learning Sciences. And Victor has been conducting studies examining the effect of different scaffolding approaches on students' complex problem-solving learning outcomes. And we have Adrian Faust, a student, a freshman majoring in computer science who is currently involved in research of AIs and neural networks. And we have Laurie Townsend, uh, Learning Services Coordinator, Social Sciences Library at the University Libraries. And Laurie's research interests include uh, cultural humility, genre theory, and information literacy, and undergraduate understanding of digital forces. Next, we have Ian Henninger, University Assessment Specialist with the UNM Office of Assessment. Ian has previously worked as a librarian, adjunct lecturer, and instructional designer. His extensive experience in teaching assessment will provide valuable insights into how we can best integrate AI into the learning experience. And finally, we have Jeff Sanging, Instructional Media Specialist at the Center for Teaching and Learning. Jet is also a doctoral candidate whose research areas include teacher feedback and culturally responsive teaching. So welcome, panelists. Now, before we begin the discussion, I would like to invite our audience to participate by submitting your question using the Q&A function. And our panelists will be able to see them and possibly answer them right there. Um, and if not, Pamela will help us group the questions. And at the end of the panel, during the Q&A portion, we will have about 10 minutes or so to answer questions as well. And if we run out of time, we'll save all the questions and try to answer them uh, afterward. So let's begin our discussion. 
So what is ChatGPT? This is a question I want to ask Lydia. Uh, so Lydia, in lay person's terms, can you briefly describe what is ChatGPT and how it works? Definitely, I'm super happy to. Um, I'll go ahead and share a few slides um, just to make it a little bit easier to walk through the technology. Um, they are very straightforward though, so don't worry. Um, let me grab my, there we go, chat window. Okay, so I'm gonna take you, to answer that question, I think it's worthwhile going back a little bit um, in history and thinking about what got us to this place of chat GPT and how this new model has now taken over the conversation of the world. Um, and we're not gonna go that back that far, um, but the uh, general idea that, that you should be able to come away with this is that the when we're building a general conversational agent, which is the goal of cat chat GTPT, is that bigger is usually better. We want some kind of large language model and that's been driving the research in this area. And this is why chat GPT seems so amazing and great because we've been able to grow these models so large with, with resources that we haven't had before. So, It's really started about four years ago with this simple little box here on the right, a transformer model. Before that, we had um, different architectures to be able to do AI that you had to think about what window input, I had to give um, a certain input to the system. Now I could just pass it everything and it, it can encode that information, do some processing on it, transform it, and then decode that output for us. So this transformer model has really changed things in the last few years. And the way it's changed has made us, let us allow us to, to build complex models to provide our better intelligence. And I'm gonna walk you through some of that history of just how it's changed in the last four years. So in 2018, we built a complex model, what we thought was a complex model then, 100 million parameter size, that's really large for um, these AI systems. And then we continue to grow it even that same year you know, over doubling the parameters that we were able to model in that AI system. Next year, we went to 1.5 billion parameters. Then we were able to grow that even higher, 8 billion parameters. There are different papers that were published about these um, that led up to ChatGPT where we are now. 18 billion parameters in 2020. And then ChatGPT, the basis of um, uh, GPT-3, which is the basis of ChatGPT, came out in 2020 with 175 billion parameters. Which is now, this is a huge model. So even two years ago, we're like, we need these huge models to build conversational agents. And it required extensive computational power. 10,000 NVIDIA GPUs, these are the highest end GPUs that cost about $10,000 each. Can you imagine $100 million of computation um, system to, to build this? and about estimated 12 gigawatts of power to train, we can think of that as about 12 hours on a nuclear reactor. So two years ago, we didn't think these things would be widely used as they are today. So you're probably thinking, how do we get to the, the place where we are now, chat GPT, just two years later, if it required this much computation power? Well, chat GPT take this, took this idea slightly different. And they said, we wanna be big, but not, just to continue to grow better, but not bigger. And so they scaled back the number of parameters and systems. So you think of it as taking that huge, large AI system and, and kind of making it smaller, but they really did it in this unique way. And if you think about it, it's like, what gives? Like, how can we have Jet GPT that's disrupting our educational system, but now it's even a smaller AI system that we had two years previously. And how they are able to do this is by training with human feedback. So if I take my system from before and I, rather than um, just trying to make it bigger and scan the web more, I take a human and a human input as to what it should learn and get some information for a particular prompt, what it should do to output in that system. What output should that system provide? Now, this is a super old school AI idea where we can do supervised learning, have a human supervise that learning system to make it learn better. But if you do it at scale, 
uh, with 13,000 input output examples is what chat GPT did, then you actually get something that starts to think and answer more like a human than the original GPT-3 did that was just two years earlier. There's other things we can do. Um, so it gives you a um, similar simple model, this kind of framework for different kinds of question prompts that we didn't have previously. But it doesn't give you a lot of generality, right? If we're only training on a small data set on a smaller system, we don't have the generality that we see and are so scared of in, in chat GPT. So we, it really takes additional human feedback for refinement and a system that can actually start to teach itself in order to continue to get better. So this is what chat GPT does that did not exist previously. Well, had existed previously, but not within the GPT system. If we take a system that can take in an input and set output some outputs, and then we ask the human, which one, which order is, how good are those outputs? Which order would you put them in terms of which are good and which are bad? Then we can use that to train another AI system that will start to learn what a human values. Does a human value a response like this? Does a human value a response like that? So we'll take those orders of those, um, imp those outputs from the other system and use them as inputs to, uh, to the reward model. And then it'll output whether or not a human thought that was good or bad. Pretty simple idea. I put this in gold for a reason. This is a really hard problem because you need a lot of human input to be able to determine this. And this is what ChatGPT did. Like it took a lot of human input in order to make this model of the reward system for the human. So we can use it to train the system itself. So what it's, and once I have this reward model, I can pretty much have chat GPT, which is how it got so good, is figure out how I should start to respond, given what a human thinks is good or bad. And now you probably see some, some developments here where I can refine that reward model as I'm going on the fly. So I can start to learn better what humans like and don't like. And I can continue to refine my original chat GPT system so I can um, figure out a better way to respond given certain prompts. So hopefully that answers your question. How we got this, this position where we are in two years with just remark this, this application of technology and the use of human resources and computational resources. That's really so, great, thank you. Oh, go ahead. You're welcome. Oh no, that's that's your answer to your question. Oh yes. So mm -hmm. uh, in a way, so ChatGPT now is that the the CEO said this is kind of like a research demo. So we are are we in a way helping them kind of you know learn a little bit as well with our thumbs up thumbs down you know with our uh, with the responses too. We do. So we start fixing this reward model. We changing that what humans yeah. tend to like and don't like. And then we can use that um, to refine the, um, the policy is what it's called that ChatGP is using to make responses. Okay. Yeah. Now, um, many of us, I think most of us have played with it quite a bit. Uh, and so uh, I enjoy experimenting with this, but can you tell me from your perspective, what is something like this ChatGPT is good at, or I mean, put in quotes, good at or bad at? <laughs> exactly. So I love this question. It's like the first one we handle when we teach AI class um, here at UNM, because it's the first thing you need to think about when you're building an AI system. How are you gonna evaluate that system? So I like to start with, with having people start to think about how to evaluate those systems. And when we, when we do AI class, it's kind of fun to think about these because we can see if our AI system is smarter than a human. This is one of the easy tests um, that people use. Can, does it outperform a human? Um, I can also take prior intelligent methods like GPT-3, um, any of these other earlier systems and compare chat GTP to it and see if it's doing any better than intelligent methods. And then if I have a mathematical or some kind of hand-tuned solution, I can also compare against that. And if I do better, sometimes we call it intelligent as well. So these are kind of the metrics we tend to use and you'll see these thrown around when you're looking, when people are talking about AI being good at things or bad at things. So that's why I wanted to cover those real quick. So if we think about um, 
these metrics and, and what ChatGP is really good at, people have rated it very helpful. Um, it, you're able to give it a, instructions, even sequential instructions, which is amazing for AI systems. And that's better than any existing um, prior AI system. So even going back, you know, it's just short history of four years or even before that, how um, helpful is the system rated compared to other systems? It's also been, there's some existing testing data sets for telling the truthfulness of a system. So this was something that the inventors of ChatGPT thought were was very critical to evaluate on the system. And what they thought, what they found was that the ChatGPT system actually ranked more truthful than existing systems so far. Now we'll take this with a grain of salt as we keep talking about ChatGPT, but this is one of the things that they had seen. And to compare it to humans, some of the earlier systems, so even this GPT-3 that ChatGPT is based on, we can take writing samples from GPT-3 and ChatGPT and compare them to writing samples from humans and do what they call as a little Turing test. Do I think it was written by a human versus a machine? And most of the tests that have been done with GPT-3 and now is being looked at with ChatGPT, it's being rated for short writing samples. It's typically what they use. Um, more better or more human-like or as human-like as human. So it gets really hard to tell whether it's human or not. So that's some of the things that we know that ChatGPT is really good at. So the next question is, what is it really bad at? So as we saw, is it's driven by this human reward system. Well, whoever those people were that OpenAI paid, there's been some studies to show like exactly what, and they declared what company they used, but where these people were and, and how, um, they defined what was good and what was bad. These labeling of what's toxic and not could be leaked into the reward system of the AI system. And now it can drive what those responses will be. So what's been seen is that, you know, we, because of that human driven reward system, there can be issues with the toxicity of the responses from chat GPT. And this has been shown with the system and, and other ones as well. Another thing that is really bad at, um, and most of these complex AI systems really have a suffer from this problem, is that it's highly um, unintelligible, right? I can't tell exactly how it came up with the response. I have a reward system. I could distinguish a little bit of why that maybe that reward system is off. But it's really hard to tell with the complex, large parameter system exactly why it's producing those responses. So interpretability is really hard for, for these systems. Um, I thought this was funny and I wanted to add this in. GPT-3 was actually shown to be really bad at common sense physics. And the reason this is, is things like that it maybe hasn't even seen before, but maybe nobody's even really asked, like, will cheese melt in the fridge? It's kind of a question that's not going to necessarily know, and it's going to be hard for it to answer. But these kinds of questions are really hard for these AI systems because you have to take things um, that really nobody tends to spend some time thinking about because it's so common sense. It's really hard to distinguish from a system what is new versus what it's trained for. And I put this in because we get really worried in AI systems that maybe AI is going to take over our job or or do something for us. Um, and it's really hard to tell if it's just like seen that experience before or if it's something new or come up with some new interpretation of it. So it's kind of emergent behavior. Um, so this is really hard to tell from these systems as well. And then this last one is the one that kind of scares me a lot, um, thinking about these ideas of safety in AI systems. And, and for us as um, educators, you know, this is also an interesting um, point as well. And it's called hallucination. So in AI systems, when I make up an answer that is just not true, but I take stuff that sounds like it um, makes sense and I put it together, I'm hallucinating. And so that hallucination can be, um, these AI systems are have a hard time because they're just working off these rewards um, to figure out what they're saying is actually true or not, or if they're just taking things that seem to go together 
to, and putting them together. This affects things in real life. So if we have a system that's making up answers, it can affect our safety or what we're answering. Um, and we get you no know, guarantees. So if I'm a student using it to answer my question, I may get a right answer or I may not. And it can be really hard to tell the difference um, from these systems as well. Cool. Well, thank you so much. That was such a great overview. And I, I, honestly, I understand it so much more than just a few minutes ago. So thank you, Lydia. So next, yeah, now that we know a little bit more about ChatGPT, we can think about, you know, okay, what's the potential of AI in education? So uh, let me ask Victor, you know, as a learning sciences faculty, what are the potential benefits of using AI in, in education? Thank you, Leo. Uh, may I share my screen? Yes. Okay. So first of all, I apologize. I thought that I had 10 minutes, but actually I need to share with Adrian. So I will rush through my slide. So my background is instructional design and technology. So I steal a slide from my instructional technology, uh, instructional design class. So it's a general like AD model to think about like how we uh, design instruction, which I highlighted the term learning objective. It's more all about this. So what will be, what will what do we want our students to learn it at the end? And then we have to align it with the learner, with the context, with the task, and then with everything else. And then uh, when I think about AI or ChatGPT, yeah, it fits into many boxes such as the context because now our students are able to use ChatGPT as part of the toolbox that they try to understand whatever questions that they are given. Um, it can be part of the instructional strategies because we can incorporate ChatGPT into it too. And it's part of the assessment too because students are able to use ChatGPT to produce some of the homework or even uh, the exam. So how should we do in the assessment? That is probably one of the biggest questions in the in the education world. Yeah, but like I will not spend too much time on it today. Um, so I start to experience like ChatGPT and my first uh, reaction is, wow, it, it is amazing. Yeah, I always teach my students that computer doesn't understand English. So like when you type in anything like in the, let's say yesterday, I teach students like use the um, li library uh, databases. Is that like those databases that just doesn't understand English. So it takes whatever we, we put in. But now like Ch ChatGPT like kind of understand English and it is very good at giving us some good in, uh, information uh, for a research topic. So I think like it is something, it is really good for us to kickstart a research project and to see like whether we may miss any important or good perspectives. So this is a screen that I, I copy yeah, from ChatGPT that I use. So I asked ChatGPT, please describe theories regarding the help seeking, which is a topic that I'm interested in now. So it was pretty good. Like it's gave me quite a lot of theories that are relevant yeah, for my like, um, uh, for my research topics. And many of those are really good. So it really helps me to move forward regarding to what, what I should consider yeah, for my research topics. So thumbs up, great. And my second, like, and I keep on playing with it. And my second reaction is what? <laughs> like it can do this? Yeah, of course, is the information that GPT gives can be fake. So this is one of the questions some 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 people like from the uh, from the audience say like how can we know like whether it's it's a fake information or not I do not have an answer so maybe Lydia or somebody like who who knows like can can help us so the basic idea is don't trust the answers uh, of ChatGPT it's kind of how we teach our students like when we go to uh, Wikipedia like go to Wikipedia to look but don't just trust it yeah because those information may not be right. Um, I think for ChatGPT, it can even be terribly wrong. <laughs> so this is one. So this is another thing that I put on. Um, I want. I'm doing a meta analysis, so I say like, "Whoa, can we? Can you show me some meta analysis articles uh, regarding to help seeking?" When I first look at it, I say, "Wow!" So it's something really good. Yeah, it looks like something I can. 
I can even borrow like in like in, in my writing. Of course, I can I should not be patronized it, but it should be something that I should borrow. But when I keep on doing it, I realizing that those citations are fake. Yeah. So it looks really, really good. Like the title is really good. The journals are the top journals in my field. Um, the people that uh, that wrote are some people that I knew, like uh, I, I read their, their articles. Yeah. But uh, I, I quit the DOI. The DOI doesn't exist. <laughs> and then I went to the journals like the year, like it, it's not there. I even went to the um, those um, those authors site the, the websites to see whether they actually publish anything like that no they didn't <laughs> so the point is coming back to this one wow it looks like they actually published something <laughs> and but the result is they, they didn't so if students actually use it in their assignments or in their publications it's terrible it's a terrible result. So what I want people, like especially students, to know is be careful. <laughs> be careful of what you are getting because whatever you get, it can be terrific, but at the same time, sometimes it can be terrible. Um, so one of the questions that people ask is, should we or we, we should let our students use ChatGPT or AI in classes? Um, I learned this from my finance class when I took my MBA. The answer is always depends. So it depends on what? It's coming back to the instructional design 101. It's the learning objectives, the students, the context, the task, the, our choices of instructional strategies and the choice of assessment. It's all of them, like when we put them in a, in a holistic sense, then we can decide like whether chat GPT is, is, a, is a good one. So um, I will not do too much about this because I know I don't have time. Um, so I want to bring up a concept by Vygotsky regarding to more knowledgeable or capable others. So in the education realm, like uh, a lot of time we think about a teacher, an expert, an older sibling, or even a peer can be that, um, can be that more capable others or more knowledgeable others. In, for instructional technologies, we have been imagining that technology can be that, but Ladoa in 2000, like suggesting that there are tons of limitations at that time. And of course, it is 20 years later, ChatGPT can do a lot more. So, but we also need to understand the limitations of AI as Lydia share with us, and we will know a lot more in the future. So what can we do with AI? This is the questions that uh, Leo brought up. Um, there are one suggestions, of course, there are many things, but I can think about is peer learning. So as I talk about using the concept for more uh, knowledgeable or capable others, the AI or ChatGPT can be that one. So when we, if I were a student, I want to use um, the, the debate as one of the learning tools. In the past, I need to find somebody to debate with me. Now I can debate with, uh, with AI, with debate with ChatGPT, and the results can be quite uh, insightful. And another thing that I, I have been using in my class is using peer review. So, and now with ChatGPT, now we have a peer. So we can do peer review with ChatGPT. So students can critique like the GPT writings or like they can let GPT to critique their work. So I think like there are multiple ways we can use ChatGPT as peer, like for peer learning. Um, so finally, technology is a tool. It is great, but it can be a disaster. So watch out. Yeah, in one of my favorite quotes, yeah, from Indiana Jones, choose wisely. <laughs> Thank you very much, Victor. And so for uh, Adrian, as a student, how do you and other students use ChatGPT and other AIs right now? I just wanted to let you know that, you know, we're not holding anybody accountable for anything. We <laughs> just done something from you all. Yes, um, I think, you know, you can separate how me and my peers use ChatGPT into two categories, productive ways or productive ways that are productive to our education and not so productive ways. So the uh, not so productive ways, I mean, you know, it's being used to fully like write essays, um, just generating responses for online discussions, answering quizzes, and, you know, doing assignments. And, you know, obviously that's 
not super effective and it's hard to catch, which is an issue too. Uh, the productive ways is that I found it quite helpful in like proofreading stuff I write. So emails, for example, I found it quite helpful. Um, it's also really helpful doing research review and concepts learned in class classes of it's been very helpful for exam review for me personally. Um, and also like as an assistant in research, if I'm trying to research a topic, I've found chat GPT to be very helpful in giving me an introduction to a basic overview. And from there I can, you know, do further research, but it gives me basically a start. Um, also, I'm a computer science student, so I'm doing a fair amount of coding. I found it helpful in, you know, as the second pair of eyes, basically, for my code, and it's been helpful at finding bugs. Well, thank you, Adrian. Um, but one quick follow-up question. I mean, you use it, other people use it, and probably different people use it at, uh, to different extents or have different levels of, ex you know, experience with it. How do you or other people learn how to use it better or well? Do you feel that we should provide that kind of education for students here? Yeah, I think uh, I think it would be helpful. I think, you know, it's a new technology, so it's going to continue to improve and be more reliable. So I think learning how to use it just as we're taught how to do, you know, research in the library, for example, would be helpful. Thank you very much. It's lovely to hear from uh, from the students' perspective. So next up, I want to you know, can we provide some practical strategies for teaching with AI? So this, let me ask Laurie first. Uh, knowing some of the strengths and weaknesses of ChatGPT, what are some of the strategies that faculty can use? Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and share. Okay, I'm going to give a little brief background on uh, learning services, and then I'll talk about some strategies, and this will be very brief. <laughs> I know we're running low on time. So I'm part of a team in the library, uh, learning services, or part of learning and outreach services, and we focus on teaching digital and information literacy. We also teach uh, a general education class, uh, IADL 1110, which is Introduction to Information Studies. And to describe the class in a nutshell, um, we had a past student uh, who called it the internet class. And so we actually include algorithms and artificial intelligence as a part of our course content. This is an introductory thousand level course in an interdisciplinary field that's concerned with the impact of technology on society and helping students navigate systems of information. So we're really looking at this at a real bird's eye view. And we're really focused on the ongoing and potential impacts of these developing technologies. We want our students to think about how they can use them effectively, as we were just hearing about, um, and also ethically while developing a critical eye for these things. So there's an in, this is actually an infographic that I'm showing you. Um, there's more information below. I'm just not showing it because I know you'll all start reading it right away. Um, so, in addition to teaching students about, so I'll just scroll down, so here's our approach, a little bit about our class, we can go right past that, I will, I will do a link to this later. Um, okay, so, the typical thing that we're actually focused on in learning services is the design of effective research assignments. So, how to guide our students through a research process that looks a lot like learning and help them build those, you know, transferable research skills so that they can use it in their careers as well as uh, while they're in college. So based on our experiences working with students and faculty on research assignments, we have some thoughts about thinking about how we deploy something like chat GPT or how we think about designing assignments with it in the room. So first of all, we think it's important to focus on the process of learning with assignments. This means building in more places for students to show the process as they complete an assignment, perhaps even including reflective assignments where students document mistakes they make as they learn and complete assignments. So they're not just having something maybe do it for them, 
Um, we work closely with the English department and their English 1120 composition courses. We see a lot of well-structured assignments with a lot of intermediate steps that lead to a final product and give students a chance to communicate what they're working on as they go along. Another thing that we might recommend is when we think about the sort of day-to-day -day regular assignments we give students throughout their learning process, we think designing assignments that require personal reflection or active learning, where they apply the concepts that they are learning, um, so they won't be able to go to chat GPT and simply ask for a summary of something, um, paste that into an assignment prompt, um, or they might try that, but it really won't work because it won't actually answer the assignment. So we're thinking about being a little bit more mindful um, and one of the things that I actually did uh, in preparing for this was try to do some of our assignments using chat GPT, and that's actually fun. Well, I thought it was fun. Um, and so thinking about how you might try to do it is a kind of an interesting exercise as a student and to, and to a little bit test your assignments to see how well they're kind of working. So the final thing that I'm going to recommend, and I'm actually going to scroll down for this, is a sense of engaging with chat GPT. And, and this is something that Victor already referenced, um, but it's just making this a partner in teaching, having students react to, critique, and edit the information it produces. Um, you can, again, ask it for discussion prompts, to debate students. There are a ton of ideas out there about using it in your teaching practice and helping encourage students to use it ethically. I have a few here that are covered from a, a librarian, Ray Pun along with a link uh, to a bunch more of these kinds of assignments um, and ideas. Um, and so there's more information and links on this infographic. Um, and I will say we've got some examples of assignments we use. Uh, and then finally, some additional recommendations with a link to a research guide that we have that has a lot more readings on uh, artificial intelligence and education. And I will say that thus far, I have recommended ChatGPT for students to help them paraphrase some sources because that's a skill that's pretty hard and it is helpful. And a, a student mentioned struggling to understand a research articles that they were trying to read in a technical field. And I suggested that they use it to help them with definitions um, while they were reading, which I think is um, something along the lines of what Adrian was talking about. Uh, so uh, let me get the link to this and I will put it in the chat. Great, thank you, Lori. And now come forward, Ian and Jet. Tell us, you know, about the resources and approaches that can support faculty in teaching with AIs. Yeah, definitely. Well, I can I can go first. Um, I would definitely echo what what Lori said. Uh, a really important part of this is moving away from assessing outputs and towards looking at processes. Because even before AI, there was always that kind of risk that those outputs could be created by someone else. Um, and so assessments that really let you see the learning process occurring, you know, live, oral, in-person, time-limited options, um, active learning, flipped classrooms, things like that. Um, and it's important to also consider assessments based on things that AI still can't do. For instance, ChatGPT is not really up on recent advances, um, current events. Its data set only goes up to 2021 or so. So it still thinks, you know, Elizabeth is the queen of England. Um, unless a human intervenes and kind of tells it that that's wrong, um, including personal or course elements, things the, that the AI can't possibly know. And then, yeah, requiring sources and citations, because as we've seen, it'll hallucinate ones that don't exist. Um, I, I concur with the panelists. You know, there's a really good opportunities for assessments that use AI, assignments that use AI to kind of compare and contrast, you know, what a human writes, what an AI writes. Um, trying to break it, trying to get it to demonstrate its limitations are all really good opportunities for demonstrating uh, critical information literacy. I think, um, and just taking a more big picture approach, I think ChatGPT also kind of presents an opportunity for us to think about our own philosophies and approaches regarding academic dishonesty, you know, um, whether it's more, more punitive, more nurturing, and, you know, are we encouraging the learning behaviors and ethics that we want, or are we just kind of encouraging, you know, not getting caught? So I think really thinking about our desired outcomes, behaviors, and kind of working back from that with all the different approaches, you know, trying to use AI, trying not to use AI can be, can be really helpful. Um, in terms of resources, I know at the end we'll share a really good LibGuide that the librarians have put together that has lots of uh, concrete links and and resources for people to consult. 
Thanks, Ian. Um, I also would like to share the resources that I put together in the chat right here. Um, in addition to what we have, um, I want to take a step back um, and you know talk about all of us, with all of us educators, like why students cheat. Um, some cases, academic dis dishonesty are committed intentionally. However, um, academic honesty in some cases reflects other problems students are facing. So we should think about that as well. For example, some students' academic dishonesty were just committed because of their poor management, time, time management, procrastination, or disorganization. So I want to um, recommend that send these students to UNMGRC, Graduate Resource Center, or CAPS, to help them manage their time to avoid economic dishonesty. Also, that for some students, lack of confidence in their own ability to learn the subject and pass a test lead them to violate academic integrity rules. Um, so we have to think about what can we do to help them feel that they're confident and succeed in their learning in the course. And for some students, Seeing the reward gain from cheating is worth taking the risk. For example, getting the good grade to graduate, obtain funding, or get praises from the friends and the um, parents, right? Um, so thinking about what Laurie and Victor talked about, what also what we can do um, with ChatGPT and what it is good at. It's good at producing answer and help students learn lower order thinking skill, right? For educator, what we can do is design learning activity and assignment that promote higher order thinking skill or HOT, um, acronym HOT, which include critical thinking and creative thinking skill. And the link that I put in the slide um, by Jessica Manbuck using technology to develop students' critical thinking skill could be a really, really useful tool for you to design such task. Also, for educator, try to get away from teaching um, skill mastery and focus on project experience process. Um, SI, like project-based assignment, um, use authentic assignment, um, to incorporate students' fund of knowledge in terms of assessment. ChatGPT would know about students' individual experience, right? And students maybe um, are likely to be cheating in high stake, um, big quizzes of exams. So break it up, make it into like smaller quizzes or exam. Um, one of the links that I share um, include promoting economic integrity. Um, it provides suggestion to instructor, for example, to explain the relevance of the course to students' goal and show confidence in your students' ability to, to succeed in your course. Um, also, probably you have to try to think about if, if you integrate students' um, assignment with information generated by AI, how would you and students cite that information? So far, APA, MLA, Chicago scholars have not decided on what would be the standard citation for this information yet. But the link that I provided somehow, some universities provide guideline for their students how to reference them, but keep checking back with those sources for the more updated version. I just wanna leave you with this also. It is important for us educators to learn about Yeah, I think your uh, audio just got cut out. Not really. Let me try this. Maybe you can hear me this way. Yes. What motivates them? What their goals are? How your course can help them achieve their goal? Um, some finding from my current dissertation study on teacher feedback revealed that students perform well and maintain academic integrity when they receive meaningful instruction and feedback and emotional support from the instructors. This is, in my opinion, one thing that AI cannot do so far. Thank you so much, Jet and Ian. Um, so um, this question, last question is for everybody, really. Um, it's about the ethical considerations. So what are some of the ethical considerations surrounding the use of AI in education? Like 
privacy concerns or the potential for bias. Uh, so anybody who would like to jump in. Uh, I mean, I oh, go ahead. Yeah. Go. Yeah. Sure. Sure. I think one big thing I'll be I'll be looking at that I'm interested in is just kind of the the labor considerations. You know, there are there are known issues with kind of intellectual property attribution, uh, lack of transparency about where these models get their information from, whose work they're using. Um, and then also the content moderation aspect, you know, we kind of have this divide, I, I was reading an article in the Guardian about kind of the differences between open AI, the company and actually open AI. Um, you know, sort of sort of that that access to who gets to use AI, do you have to pay for it, and kind of the pros and cons of having it uh, reside with a company who can, you know, kind of um, put a little bit of a wall around things and intervene if the model starts spitting out biased or inaccurate behavior. Um, so that could be a good thing, but then you also see cases like, I believe it was OpenAI that was using uh, moderators in Kenya who are being paid $2 an hour, right? Um, so you contrast that with truly open models. There was a recent leak of, I think, Meta's uh, AI model. And so, you know, kind of that could be a good thing for, for open source information, but then it could also um, be a bad thing for bad actors kind of using that with, you know, little to no oversight. So I think that's kind of kind of interesting to look at going forward. Yeah. Uh, Lydia? Um, I think for the computer science side, one of the things we've been looking at is a lot of the easy programs we give to students are were already out there on the web, but they were pretty easy to search and know that they had copied direct code. And, and, and so what is the boundary between copying code on the web versus copy using ChatGPT to answer your questions for you? And, and what kind of contributions do students have to really make in order to make something their own when, when those resources were in some ways already available? So yeah, this is something we've been struggling on uh, with, and I, I don't think we have great answers yet, but um, hopefully we will. Those ethical questions still keep surfacing. And even coming from the librarian perspective, is that you know in the past we use Google or other search engine, we see a list, and then we can kind of look at them, review them, evaluate them, and now the algorithm will pick up whatever is the best answer. Even like the Chat GPT Pal Bing will pick up several. But how do they pick those out? I'm, I'm really not sure. So, and that's something that I've been struggling with. It. How do we make sure that you know brings out the appropriate you know answer in some ways? Okay. Oh, Laurie. Oh no. Are we are we wrapping up? I was just going to say no, no, from no, no. a Go ahead. We have some time. perspective. I'm a little bit concerned about. The internet already started hiding the way information was created and how much effort it took and how those processes work from some people. Um, and I feel like this takes it even a step further. And I do worry about um, students' understanding of exactly why and how our information gets created and disseminated and about what that actually means for the future. We've seen how journalism collapsed you know, after the internet and how the, the, the whole thing has shrunk. And I do wonder what that looks like for the future um, with journalism and just with student understanding of like where their information comes from and who's doing this. And it makes me, it just makes me concerned because I don't, it, you can't force somebody to know that. And this very much hides that. Um, That's a good point. Anyone else have any um, perspectives on this or what you, what concerns you? Hey, from a learning scientist perspective, I think we, we need to get back to the like the, pur the, the purpose of education, like what, what are we actually doing? And I, I, I skip a, line, a slide talking about typewriter. It's a, it's a great technology at the time. Yeah, so in, in high school or something, even in the college, yeah, we have typewriting classes. But after we're processing, like those are not needed anymore. So I think like we, our education needs to move forward with the technologies that are available to us to think about what are we act like, what's the students actually need? Like what are the skills, the knowledge they need to enter the workforce so that they can be a productive components in the society. So um, 
we we need to revisit like our syllabus and our curriculum yeah in order to know um like it's it's coding like it's the basic coding hello world is important yeah if it is important like in in what sense and how are we able to help our students from like a very beginning like programmer like who only knows the hello world to all the way like to to do the ai <laughs> so like this is something that we need to as an educator, we need to spend more time to think about it. So, um, okay. So uh, thank you very much for all your um, uh, perspectives and your answers to my questions. I just want to share my screen again. Um, so we're thinking about, you know, next steps, you know, what's next for after this? I, I believe this is a great, you know, initial conversation, but as, you know, just looking at some of the questions who've been answered in the Q&A, so you can take a look at those as well, is that there are a lot of questions and there are a lot of things we need to think about. And we're hoping that we will have more of these discussions and then decide on, you know, um, some of the actionable uh, uh, things that we can do. So you will receive, everybody who registered for this will receive a, uh, post panel survey, just very, very short, just to ask you, what would you be interested in learning more about in the future? So we can plan, you know, uh, plan for those. And uh, Laurie has already shown you, shown you the, the, the lib guide that we have now, and we hope, hope and hopefully we'll keep adding more resources to it. So please check that out. And um, I just want to thank uh, thank you to our panelists for sharing your insights and expertise on the on the impact of AI in education and your contributions to this discussion has been uh, really invaluable. So thank you again for uh, spending the time with us today. And thank you for the audience for your questions and answers. We'll keep track of all, uh, the Q&A actually, which I'll compile them in and share them in, in uh, another venue too. So thank you again. So. Uh, take care and hopefully see you next time.